Everyone, hi. Once again, this is Bruce Moffson, LCSW, coming at you from Sunridge of Nevada. And tonight, a little different motif, okay? A little different perspective. Normally, for those of you who have watched our videos, we take a, a, an artist, we take a movie, we take a sporting event, and we break it down clinically. We're not doing this tonight. Tonight's a little different uh, perspective. As everyone knows, literally around the world, on March 31st in L.A., Nipsey Hussle was shot and killed by Eric Holder. And I want to talk about different aspects of Nipsey Hussle's life. I don't want to get in, I'm not going to talk about his music. We get it. It was great, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I don't want to get into breaking down lyrics. We're looking at things clinically. That's not the point. I want to talk about his life and what happens now after his death. And we're going to break it down to various segments. We'll talk about jealousy and envy call to action, mental health issues, and where do you go from here, coping with the loss, from particularly from his family's perspective, that was obvious, was a very close-knit, loving family. Here we go. We, what we do know, what we know, know as of now, okay, because I'm sure it's going to change in the next several weeks, several months, probably several years, is that Eric Holder walked up to where Nipsey was sitting out, standing outside with his friends, just because he owned, we all know this already, he had marathon clothing and he had other businesses in that little uh, shopping center, multiple stores, blah, blah, blah. He was just there enjoying himself and he walked up to him and he knew him. It wasn't like someone like out of the, you know, out of the blue. He knew who Nipsey was and by all accounts shook his hand recognize him as a musician, as a well-known rapper, and from there something happened. What it is, I'm not going to even ascertain. We're guests. We'll play armchair detective. It's a waste of time. But from that encounter, he felt compelled to get a weapon and shoot Nipsey and kill him. And on some level, there was a jealousy factor. There was like, I'm going to get this guy. He you know, I need to, you know, make him know who I am. And on some level, he lost it with the jealousy and just the envy of who Nipsey was. And I just want to clarify something about that. When you see someone having success and you feel that that success belongs to you and you look at yourself with anger and fury and depression, you've lost it. Okay, Nipsey was Nipsey with his own music, this person, whatever, whatever music career he had. But when, you, when you're envious of other people's success, it's a recipe for disaster. It will never end well. And I've said this before in life. You have a thing called a bank. It's called a favor bank. You always make more deposits than you do withdrawals. Be happy for other people's success. If he would have said to him, hey... I know who you are. I grew up in this neighborhood. I'm impressed what you do with the clothing store and the barber shop and the stem cells and the housing for low-income people, the apartment building, and all the other things that you're trying to do, and I admire your music. We wouldn't be having this conversation tonight. That's the point I'm trying to bring out. Be happy for others, and it comes back to you. Now, the next question is becoming successful and returning back to the hood, where to the neighborhood, where where you grew up, is that a smart and safe thing to do? You know, the whole idea is you know keeping it real, keeping it real, be real. Because being accessible, I understand why people go back. You know, particularly musicians. Like, I grew up with nothing. Now I have something. I want to go back and give something back. I mean, it's not a secret that he you know, grew up in that neighborhood and he was, you know, buying up the properties, you know, combining them to give like a, like a mini mall, so to speak, was he grew up there. He saw the poverty, saw how hard people worked and he wanted to give something back. Well, you know, fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. It's great. But does it do something visceral to people emotionally that they, they see you and you're no longer... You're just not, you know, you're not like on a billboard anymore. You're not performing before 5,000 people. You're like me and I could do what I want to you. Just a little little odd. 
you know, does Jeff Bezos go back to his old engineering firm before he started Amazon? I don't think so. Did Bill Gates hang out with his high school buddies? Maybe one or two that went with him to, you know, his computer company. But I doubt other people, you know, you don't really necessarily go back to where you came from if, you, if you've moved on. So think about it from that perspective. Now, let me just share this with people to get a concept, though, because I was reading about an article where someone, you know, my, my producer was talking about an interview. They were asking another musician, are you going to go back now after what happened with Nipsey? He said no. I'll tell you this from experience. After the federal building in Oklahoma City was destroyed, that's when concrete barriers went up in front of every federal building. No more could a truck go through and get right into the epicenter, the nerve center, and blow, you, blow itself up. Th those days were gone. Now, any federal building, any city building, state building, you see the barricades. And they're built differently now. You don't have the access that you used to have in the front. Things are angular. Things are angled. Window views are restricted. They changed it because of what happened. It changed it forever. After Columbine, schools changed how they, how they looked at students that had mental illness. I mean, we saw at Parkland, Florida last year, has in, you know, still shootings, unfortunately, but new schools that are being built, <clears throat> you don't have the access that you used to have. You got to go this way. You got to show a pass. You got to present yourself. Now, they angle the classrooms differently. They teach you how to fight back. They have safety areas. It's very different. You look what happened here in Las Vegas. Um, on the night of the shooting. Hotels have changed now. How they look at guests, how they look at security. Now they have their own private SWAT teams in case something happens. I can tell you this much. The days of seeing your favorite musician, particularly rappers, is going to change dramatically after this. And the days of people coming back and giving stuff out, we're having a fun day, we're a barbecue day, we're a uh, Christmas turkey day, They'll still do it, but it's not going to be them. Or if they do do it, it's going to be around so many security guards, you'll never get past you know, the first layer. It's going to change. Because people are going to say, I'm fearful for my life. I don't want to be a Nipsey and leave behind two small children. So there will be changes. There will be fallout and there will be changes from this. Call to action. I saw the video of the different gangs getting together, walking down the avenue, go walking to the store. Like they said, about eight hundred or so. From I think it was from two to five, three to five, whatever. Okay, here's my question: eight hundred or so people walk down, let's say half a mile. The march is now over. The memorial is going to be in a few days. What happens now? Is the truce going to last through the, through the memorial service? Does it last the day after? What if someone gets angry over someone's wearing colors with a wrong hang signal, with a wrong neighborhood, with a wrong anger, with a wrong frustration? Do the guns come out? Do the knives come out? Is more blood going to be shed? What are people going to learn from this, and where do they go from here? Are any of the people going to say, you know what, this is insanity, we're going to drop all our weapons, no more, we're done? We're all going to go to college and become entrepreneurs like Nipsey? We're all going to get state jobs and become civil servants? We're all going to be taking care of our kids, no more graves, none of that's going to disappear? We're going to work on changing one block at a time to make it economically viable like the rest of uh, Los Angeles? What, what happens now? That's my question. I just don't want to see empty gestures because that's the most depressing thing of all. Are they going to keep his stores open? Are people going to buy his clothing? Are they going to go to his barber shop? How are they going to memorialize what he tried to do for the community? I mean, the man did so much with his thinking of like, keep the money in, keep the money in. Going back to Malcolm X, by any means necessary, people didn't understand that comment. What he meant was economic power. By any means necessary is like obtaining money. That is the true power in America. Not blasting away. Not going to funeral after funeral. So what is the legacy of Nipsey for these people? Where do we go from here? And my question to people that are going to be watching this video. 
is what are you personally going to do? If you say to me, I'm a fan of his, I loved his music, I loved his story, that's great. That's wonderful. Now, unfortunately, he's gone. What are you going to do? Don't tell me you're going to be the next, next Nipsey. That's not going to happen. But what are you going to do to make the world around you a better place? What are you going to do things in your school, at your job, with your family? How are you going to elevate his memory now that he's dead to make his soul in heaven smile and say, at least I had a positive legacy on Bruce, for instance? Bruce is a better father. He's a better husband. He's a better worker. He's more attentive. He's more assuming. He realizes life is precious. So what do you go from here? What do you do from That's what I'm asking people. And I'd like you to do, you know, if anyone has the, the confidence to do so, and don't do it this week, don't do it next week, don't do it next month, but write me, write in the comments section, what have you done to do something different about yourself? And I'm going to describe some various things that you can do on your own. But what are you, what are you going to do differently? That's what I'm the most curious about. And is it, now don't do, don't just talk to talk. I want you to walk the walk. Mental health awareness. No shock to me that Eric Holder was arrested as he was trying to get himself admitted to a mental health facility. What a shock. What a surprise. And that he has, according to what I've read as of up to today, mental health issues. He's been admitted prior at least once before. And I guarantee if this is true and they look at his juvenile history, I guarantee there's multiple mental health issues there, multiple. So we're not condoning what he did, of course not. We're not giving him a pass. But he was mentally ill, more than likely. And it just shows, again, the untreatedness of mental illness, what it leads to. This false bravado, this, this anger, this frustration, that he felt the only recourse was someone who may have dismissed him or was interested in talking to him at that very moment, was to come back and shoot him. Like, how insane. And it just shows you the mental illness. I don't want to use the word insane. I shouldn't say the word insane. But how sad and how dreadful that that was the only alternative that came to mind was violence. That's all he knew was violence. And going back to that with the sense of violence is that Nipsey said in an article in the LA Times, he said, I'm going to quote this. My uh, producer got on this. We deal with death with murder. Quotes. It was like living in a war zone where people die in these blocks and everybody's a little bit immune to it. I guess they call it post-traumatic stress when you have people that have been at war for such a long time. Quote, you know, I think L.A. suffers from that because it's not normal, yet we embrace it like after a while, like it is after a while. Yeah, crazy becomes normal. And it becomes part of your daily routine, you know, pop, 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 pop. Yeah, my brother is in a wheelchair because the bullet nicked his spine. He can't walk again. Yeah, my, my, my sister's best friend lost a baby because shrapnel hit her and it killed a fetus. You know, my youngest brother died in my arms because we got into a beef with another gang over whose block it was. You know, my dad's been locked up in prison for the next 40 years because of double homicide. And his uncle's in prison and so is his two brothers. It becomes normal. That's when it becomes scary. Because having PTSD is a very, very serious disorder to have. When this becomes the norm, when pop, pop, pop is a normal reaction to everything in your life and you're constantly you know, looking for cover and huddling, there's a problem there. And he, he was correct in talking about it. Because the, the more you kill the more you develop yourself a sense of not able to deal with reality because it's not real anymore. And you're not in combat. You're not a police officer. You're not a fireman. They have enough stress. You know, you're not a correctional officer. But you're just going about your day-to-day -day and you got PTSD symptoms. Everyone in that, in that vicinity, that is scary. That's an untreated sucking wound of mental, severe mental health issues that lend itself to depression, oh, what a shock, hypertension, stress, diabetes, strokes, heart attacks, terrible eating because you eat as a way to cope. So obesity, diabetes, all bad things. He was correct. Finally, the last piece I want to talk about is coping with loss. You know, 
listening to his family talk, his mother talk, and his dad talk, and his brother talk, and his grandmother talk, I'm going to get to that in a second, you realize he came from a very close-knit family. And obviously, his mother is American, and but the dad is from Africa, and he's Eritrean. Okay, it's a country next to Somalia, I'm sorry, Ethiopia. And there's a large community in America of, of people from that from that country. So what did, you know, how did they remember him? What, what have the people have done who have moved there from Eritrea and Eritreans? The grandmother, Margaret Boutte, she said, young people get the message. She said, live a better life, continue his life. And there's a reason why he called his clothing line, of course, the marathon clothing, was he saw what he was trying to do as a marathon, not as a sprint. He knew what was going to happen overnight. You got to get the store. You got to rehab the store. You got to get the right store. You got to get the right mix. You know, thing by thing, item by item, store by store. So it was a marathon. That's why he called it marathon clothing. What did he put together in his short period of life? Impressive. The marathon clothing in 2017, he had just started an apartment building for low-income housing, for low-income families, I'm sorry. Starting a barbershop, we had a barbershop, co-working space. He wanted to emulate Silicon Valley, and he started a STEM, which is science and math, for LA youth to get together and push that because he sees that he saw that as everyone else does as the, as the jobs of the future. Science, math, science, math, science, math. He's leaving behind two children. That's what's even sadder to me. Two young children that will never see their dad again. Now, something about Nipsey is that I'm sure he's laughing about this in heaven is that, you know, you think you know, you think you know <coughs> about the impact you have on other people. You never know. You never really, really know till if you're lucky enough to have like a memorial about you if you're 80. And they talk about you. You retire from a job and they say supposedly nice things about you. But it was a quote I wanted to say. This guy writes this. Miguel Hernandez, 27 years old. I came over the U.S. border, my mom's stomach. My mom's stomach. I had no vision. But coming up, Nip and what he did, he inspired and he put something in me. He drove seven and a half hours to a memorial in Minneapolis just to be there. I think he came from Wisconsin to Minneapolis. He drove seven and a half hours. And he's not Eritrean, you know, he's not African-American, clearly Latino, Miguel Hernandez. But he drove seven and a half hours to be there because he felt there was a connection. And, and so often with musicians where people that, you know, do work in mental health, <clears throat> People will say years later, you changed my life, you saved my life. And then we, we, we laugh about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you never realize the impact you have on other people for good and for bad. And finally, his mother said something. She said, Angelique Smith, they said they should live their lives to the fullest, talking about people that are you know mourning his death, and focus on leading by example. This is her, as her son had done prior to his, you know, talking about trying to make sense of her son's passing. And the father, um, Dawit Askadom, who is, he's the African one in the mix, she's obviously American, he said it was like he was sent by God to bring us together. Trying, the grandmother, the father, and the mother, just being very, very positive, trying to make sense of this horrific event. close with this the grief that the parents are dealing with behind closed doors I can only imagine I, I you know I know about tragedy of children and th their courage and their ability to say these statements in the public eye when they would love I'm sure nothing better than be alone in their bedroom is is staggering to me and all the kudos and to them on this terrible terrible occasion that they're you know their presentation the death of a child is a level of grief you cannot begin to comprehend and you cannot begin to comprehend unless you've lived it yourself and my heart goes out to them and their entire family you want to honor his memory and his family you really want to do that 
you know what, accomplish something with your life and then tell them and write them a letter so it's tangible. Put it on a video clip and put it on a zip drive and mail it to them. You know, go to the store and say, can I speak to the father? Can I speak to the mother? Can I speak to the brother? I just want to say this happened. You know, send pictures of what you've accomplished. And people are going to say, now, I'm going to be like Nipsey. I'm gonna... Don't, you're not going to be the next Nipsey. That's not going to happen. But here's what you can do. Finish high school. Leave an abusive relationship. Spend time with your children and don't scream and curse at them. And just talk to them. Do something with them. Don't hit your wife. Don't hit your girlfriend. Avoid drugs and alcohol. Save your money it's for something important in life. Going to school, buying a car, getting a home. Get away from a toxic environment of people around you that are negative. Donate blood. Volunteer somewhere. Show you have an impact. A million people do that. Then Nipsey looks down from heaven and he smiles. Is like, I, my life was not about my music. My life was about what I left behind, the seeds that I planted that are growing into plant after plant after plant, creating a forest. That's how you show that you're remembering him and honoring him in front of his family to give them some real solace. So that when they go through the grief for the rest of their life, and trust me, that's probably what's going to happen, they can hold on to that. They can just say, wow, she did this, he did this, he did this, she did this. That's how you honor two people, three people, four people, five people that are going through so much and an entire country that's grieving over his loss as well. That's how you know he made an impact and how he changed lives by you changing your life. Thank you for watching. I'm interested in getting comments about this video and how people feel about it, what your thoughts are, and if you're doing something about yourself. You know, if you tell me, Bruce, because of what he did, I'm getting myself some mental health treatment. I'm, I'm doing something positive. I'm going to go see a therapist. I'm going to go see a doctor. I want to work on my mental health issues. I want to try and make better choices, better decisions. You know what? Then that says that what I said tonight made an impact that ripples, like throwing a pebble into a pond and the ripple, ripple, ripple. I've done something to honor Nipsey. Everyone, thank you for watching. Bruce Muffson from Sunridge of Nevada. Always appreciated.